Ready or Not has no shortage of unnerving scenarios and locations. You don't have to look any further than the third mission if you're looking for an experience that'll really creep you out. But there's only been one level that's made me feel as if I were actually playing a horror game. Its setting and enemies and story all feel so otherworldly and spooky. And the mission itself doesn't feel too far off from a Resident Evil game. I'm talking, of course, about the Carriers of the Vine Cult at Cherryessa Farms. Now, for all intents and purposes, Cherryessa of Farms seems to be locally known as the creepy cult place. I mean, it's mentioned right in our report that over the years there's been all these rumors and stories about what happens at the farm. But until now, nobody has really been exactly sure what goes on in there. From the outside in, it appears to be just a run-down, overgrown family farm. And aside from a makeshift gun range and a strange symbol out front, nothing seems to be too out of the ordinary. That is, until we receive a call forcing our arrival to the scene. Now, prior to our arrival, we're told in a briefing that there's been a shootout between the people at the farm and the local police. Evidently, some of the cult members had driven into town and assaulted a man at a gun store before driving off and heading back to their compound. Local police managed to track down the vehicle's license plate and found the address to be registered at Cherryessa Family Vineyards. Now, two local cops, Garcia and Perez, arrive to the farm, where their squad car is promptly fired upon forcing them to crash into a fence before even reaching the front door. Sergeant Perez is killed in the ensuing gunfight, and at the time of her call to dispatch, Officer Garcia is pinned down by gunfire. Now, when we arrive, we see uh, none of this. <laughs> I think it's assumed that as we pull up, we manage to get a hold of them, because seeing as all of this went down right next to the entrance, and you can't find either of these officers anywhere on the map, I think it's implied that we managed to extract both of the officers. But anyways, we're dealing with a very hostile cult here, and our mission is to bust into their compound, rescue any civilians, and arrest the ringleader of whatever is happening here. Now, shortly upon our arrival at the scene, we can quickly realize that this cult is entirely female-based. The symbol that we see throughout the property is actually just an altered version of the female gender symbol, and all of the people that we encounter on this map are women, which in itself is pretty interesting. If you follow true crime at all, you would probably know that the vast majority of violent crimes are committed by males. So having a violent group of women committing all of these crimes is a pretty unique circumstance. Anyways though, as we begin our entrance into the house, in addition to the typical cult paraphernalia that we'd expect, we also start to see a couple of different patterns. For instance, most if not all of the decorations in the house depict women, which tracks, you know, seeing as this is a female cult, it would make sense that they'd be really big on female iconography, right? However, there are actually a few times that we'll see men in these paintings, and in nearly all of them, the man is being subjected to castration. In fact, the theme of castration is present in some of the other paintings too, which is very concerning to say the least, uh, but just put that knowledge in the back of your mind for right now. It, it's going to be important later. We also begin to notice a pattern in the books that we see lying around. For instance, we see a book labeled Human Anatomy, and later we'll find ones more focused around healthcare and psychology. And seeing these sorts of medical-related books after what we saw in the paintings is sort of starting to paint a picture that I'm not all that fond of. But anyways, we continue to clear out the building and investigate it. As we move from room to room, we can begin to see that most of the women here are a abiding by a dress code. Aside from just two of them, all of the women seem to wear shaved hairstyles, white dresses, and vine tattoos covering their arms. Now, dress codes are typically seen as a way for cults to break down a person's individuality. After all, limiting a person's self-expression is a great way to keep them obedient. In addition, a dress code can also help to differentiate the levels of power that a particular member holds. And as such, we can find two women that, instead of white, are wearing the color red and these two just so happen to be the main suspects that we're after. The first is the leader of the group, a woman named Elaine Raskin. Now, Elaine is a former USIA operative who was discharged for undisclosed reasons, and over time, she would begin to develop these sorts of misandrous tendencies. Before long, those tendencies evolved into a full-fledged hatred of men, which eventually led to the founding of her ideology. Now, to be honest, I'm not all that sure where this hatred arose. Most 
Most of the other women seemed to have more private vendettas against men that personally attacked them, but Elaine's hatred seems to run much deeper than that. My best guess is that she saw something disturbing during her time working with the government, and that's what led to her radicalization. Now, the other woman in red is Eve Nader, who had been reported missing by her family over a decade ago. Eve had been a constant victim of domestic violence and sought refuge at a women's shelter, carried the crisis LLC, and the owner of this shelter was none other than Elaine Raskin. Now this shelter is eventually shut down for obvious reasons, and that's when Elaine rebrands it into the Carriers of the Vine cult. Over time, Elaine has managed to brainwash and groom Eve into becoming the perfect cult member, and it would appear that she's starting to do the same to several others. When we make our way into Elaine's quarters, we can find yet another one of these graphic paintings, as well as some chains, a bowl, and several severed human fingers. Anyways, aside from all of this, the room doesn't really have anything of consequence. We only start to find out what's really going on here when we make our way into Eve's room. The walls are adorned with labeled portraits of men, surrounded by newspaper clippings and photos. All of the men featured on this wall are noted as being horrific monsters, some being sex criminals and others being violent wife beaters. Based on what we see here, it would appear that the women of this cult have been planning revenge attacks on the men that assaulted them. For instance, one of the men on the board stands accused of using date rape drugs at a local nightclub, and when his victims aren't lucid enough to defend themselves, he kidnaps and sexually assaults them. The conspiracy board goes on to suggest that the women of this cult plan on kidnapping him and taking him back to their compound and chopping his manhood off. But anyways, for now we need to set aside our judgments because we still have a job to do. Although we've already arrested Elaine and Eve, there's still an entire side of the property that we haven't cleared yet. So we make our way outside and into the courtyard. Now the courtyard and beyond is probably one of the more surreal areas of this game. It's to me where this mission starts to feel as though we're in a bit too deep. Right in the center of the courtyard is a massive shrine of the symbol that we've seen earlier. It sits atop a bed of flowers and tree limbs, and just below it sits the skull of a longhorn. Immediately to the left of it is a sniper's nest, and to the right sits a sort of barracks area for some of the cult members. Down below is also a pretty expansive wine cellar that you'll need to clear, but none of these areas hold anything of any real consequence. Instead, we'll continue out past the courtyard to find two distinct paths. One one which leads to the left, and another that goes further back into the woods. For now though, we'll ignore the path left, and we'll focus on the one in front of us. As we work our way back through the woods, we see yet another one of these makeshift shrines. What had at first felt like an oddity on this mission has now become commonplace. When we look past the shrine though, we find ourselves in front of a dilapidated church. If we walk to the right and up to the second level, we'll find ourselves in the congregation room, beyond the empty pew and rows of vines, we find a statue carved out of a tree, which is going up and out of the church. This room right here is what made me initially draw the Resident Evil connection, because you can't really look at this and feel like you're not in a horror game. But anyways, I'm not too sure what the statue here is supposed to depict. I hypothesize that it's the Greek goddess Hera, who is the goddess of women. Reason being, I wouldn't find it too out of the ordinary for a feminine cult like this to worship the goddess of women. It, it makes sense. Also, we can find a portrait of Medusa sitting in Elaine's room, so it's obvious that they've got some sort of interest in Greek mythology. But at the same time, I'm not well versed on it myself, so please take that with a grain of salt. But anyways, we can see bloody handprints going down the base of this statue, and when we make our way down into the lower level, we find what can only be described as a torture chamber. Along the floors are chains and metal collars bolted to the walls. Next to them sits empty food bowls, and if you look closely, you can see blood stains covering the walls next to them. On one side sits a dog cage, and on the other appears to be wooden stocks. The further we investigate the room, the clearer the picture starts to become come, we find a car battery and jumper cables, a hammer, a knife, and a sickle. Now the sickle is especially important because if you don't remember, that was the primary tool that we saw in all of those different paintings around the house. And given the context of the situation and what we've seen prior, it's safe to assume that the women of this cult dragged their victims here, beat them, 
torture them and eventually castrate and kill them. And considering that there are no men currently down here and there are massive puddles of blood, I can only guess that they've already gone through several people. And this suspicion is confirmed when we head back towards the courtyard and take the other path that we passed earlier, where we see four shallow graves dug next to an outhouse. Placed on each of these graves are little twigs formed in the shape of the cult symbol, and in one of the graves we can see a shovel still planted upright, suggesting that these men were buried very recently. So the cult has thus far killed at least five people that we know of. There was the police officer in the shootout, and then these four graves that we see here. Now, my opinions on this situation are wildly conflicting, right? Uh, on one hand, I can sort of understand where these women were coming from. Many of them were subjected to the worst type of abuse imaginable, and that's the sort of thing that haunts people for life. And many of these same women saw their attackers just continue to go on with their lives, facing no real repercussions for the pain that they inflicted. And although I can't imagine that feeling, I can understand their desire to want to get revenge. Now, on the other hand, I think that all of these women are batshit fucking crazy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you can quickly gather that from just walking around the property. If the women were all working through their trauma legally and still doing some of the weird pagany stuff, I really wouldn't have a problem with it. But when you start having bloody castration rituals and killing people and shooting cops and stuff, that's when you start to lose me. <laughs> I think that the real tragedy in all of this is that a lot of these traumatized women were taken advantage of not only by abusive men, but also the systems that were supposed to be in place to help them. Elaine Raskin's cult started off as a battered women's shelter and over time evolved into a violent extremist ideology. She managed to convince her followers that these heinous acts were healthy and okay, and in the process, she ruined the lives of countless recovering women. Cheriessa is yet another chapter of exploitation that we see in Ready or Not. It's obvious that this is just a smaller part of something much larger going on within the game. And perhaps later in this series, we can begin to draw more connections between these stories and see how they relate with one another. At the end of the day, though, I think that Cheriessa Farms is one of the best moral dilemmas presented in Ready or Not, and overall just a really unsettling map. Uh, but I'd love to hear your all's thoughts on it. Do you think that the cult had any sort of redeeming quality? or were they just a bunch of crazies? You be the judge. <laughs> but anyways though, I really appreciate you guys tuning in and watching today's video. You know I love you. I'm out.